My name is Becky Lockhead and I'm the librarian here at the Society of Antiquaries of London. I'm primarily responsible for looking after our printed collections, including cataloguing books and journals and managing the provision of our electronic resources to fellows of the Society. Our library contains around 130,000 printed items spanning over five centuries in date, from the earliest decades of Western printing right up to the present day. Our particular collecting focus is the material remains of the past in Britain. This includes archaeology, antiquities, historic monuments, local British history, heraldry, medieval decorative arts and architectural history. We also collect on the history of antiquarianism itself and the history of collecting, so we have books on the activities of some of the society's 18th century founders and the important antiquarian networks of the day. Less comprehensively, we collect on the archaeology of Northern and Western Europe. Our holdings include some 3,000 historic and current journal titles. These include journals and transactions of archaeological and local history societies from around the UK, and a number of titles from archaeological institutions across Europe, particularly from Germany. For many of these international journals, we are the only copy holder in the UK. So the library is an important resource for researchers to study modern European scholarship, as well as that of the British Isles. The printed collection has built up from the early days of the Society. When the Society was founded in the early 18th century, we didn't have a permanent headquarters as meetings took place in a tavern. But right from the outset, Director John Talman was instructed to provide us a box to lay up the books in. The first book purchased for the Society was John Stripe's 1720 edition of the Surveys of the City of London and Westminster by John Stowe. Over the subsequent centuries, as the Society and its fellowship expanded, and our lodgings became more permanent, so too did the Library, especially because Fellows presented copies of their books or left the Society substantial book bequests in their wills. Because the library collection reflects the interests of many different individual collectors and writers, it includes a surprisingly broad array of subjects, from books on witchcraft, to medical history, geometry, the natural world, astrology, astronomy, navigation and travel. One of our really important donations was a collection of printed broadsides and proclamations by the philosopher Thomas Hollis in 1756. Many are unique surviving copies, such as this Jacobean broadside printed in 1615 by the Virginia Company. The Virginia Company was set up in 1606 to establish settlements on the coast of North America, and this broadside advertises a public lottery in England to raise money for the settlement of Jamestown, which had suffered greatly from disease and starvation since its foundation. These images are the earliest printed illustrations of Native Americans from what is now Virginia. Fifteen unique broadsides were printed by the Virginia Company and five are preserved in our library collection. Over 2,000 of our broadsides and proclamations are digitised and available via EEBO, the Early English Books Online Database. They include a rare proclamation announcing the reign of the 15-year-old Lady Jane Grey on 10th of July 1553. Jane is known to history as the Nine Days Queen, as she was deposed by the Catholic Mary I only nine days afterwards. You can even hear some of our rare Tudor broadside ballads being sung on the website of the freely accessible English Broadside Ballad Archive, such as this, a godly ditty dedicated to Queen Elizabeth I printed in 1856. This is the only copy of this printed broadside known to survive. In 1974, the Society received a bequest following the death of fellow Anthony W.G. Lowther, which contained around 400 printed books from the 17th to 19th centuries and some 1,600 tracts from the Civil War period. These printed tracts were later repackaged and catalogued and all are searchable on the library's online catalogue. Collectively, they are a substantial and significant historical resource for the study of the Civil War and the Commonwealth period in England. Our earliest printed books date back to the first decades of Western printing, following the invention of the movable type printing press by Johannes Gutenberg in the mid-15th century. Books printed before the end of 1500 are known as incunabula or incunables. We have just over 50 incunables in our collection, 
Over half of these were bequeathed by the architect and fellow Arthur Ashbutal in 1869, part of a substantial bequest of some 2,400 printed books, many of them of early date. The incunables range from religious works, such as Bibles and sermons, to chronicle histories, classical texts, such as Cicero and Ovid, and medieval literature, including Boccaccio and Dante. Most are in Latin, and many have woodcuts, and some have initials and decoration illuminated by hand. One of the most famous is the Liber Chronicarum, or Nuremberg Chronicle, a richly illustrated world history first published in Nuremberg in 1493, with an astonishing 1800 images from around 642 woodblocks. Three of our incunables were formerly owned by William Morris. This theological work by the medieval theologian Alexander of Hales was printed in Venice in 1475. It played a crucial role in the development of the Kelmscott Press. William Morris took it to a paper manufacturer in Kent as a guide for the paper to be produced for his Kelmscott Press venture as Morris considered the handmade and unbleached paper of this book to be perfection in terms of quality and of texture. As well as the craftsmanship, Morris was also deeply influenced by medieval and renaissance design. And I couldn't not mention Morris without showing off our finest book by the Kelmscott Press, the breathtaking works of Geoffrey Chaucer, printed in 1896. This is a complete edition of Chaucer's writings with type and decoration designed by Morris and illustrations by his close friend and collaborator, the Pre-Raphaelite artist Edward Byrne Jones. As I mentioned earlier, the library contains many historical books on archaeology and the study of material remains, such as these antiquarian books on ancient monuments like Stonehenge and Avebury. They include works by William Stukeley, a pioneer of archaeological investigation, and the Society's first secretary, whose portrait hangs on the staircase outside of this library. Books like this reveal how our ancestors recorded the evidence of the past and how it was interpreted, debated and reassessed, reflecting changing approaches over time and charting developments in fieldwork and observational recording. We also house important early works published by the Society itself, including our flagship journal, Archaeologia, which began in 1771, and Vetusta Monumenta, Ancient Monuments, published from 1718 to 1906. The latter is a series of illustrated antiquarian papers on a range of historical sites and objects, mostly in Britain, including coins, seals, documents, buildings, wall paintings, mosaics, and artifacts. Some of the earliest published research on the Rosetta Stone appeared in Vetusta Monumenta in 1803, and these detailed engravings made the remarkable discovery more widely available and accessible in an age before photography. Between 1821-3, Vetusta Monumenta published the first complete colour reproduction of the Bayer Tapestry, and the Society also holds the hand-coloured engravings made from the tapestry itself by draftsman Charles Stotthard. A project hosted by the University of Missouri is currently underway to create a digital scholarly edition of the first three volumes of the Chuster Monumenta with high quality images and a new academic commentary. It is freely available to browse online and fittingly brings this printed work a monument in its own right for the study of antiquity and the history of antiquarian research, attitudes and techniques to a worldwide audience. Of course, this short summary barely scratches the surface of a rich and diverse collection such as this. So do have a look at our collection highlights on the Society's website. And you can also search for printed books, journals and publications in our library catalogue. Just go to library.sal.org.uk.